miss you about three months. Take me off the trip. I'm going to miss you so much. Please come home safe, okay? Go do. This is Channel's Television's Breaking News. regarding a submarine that has sunk in the middle of the sea. Hundreds are reported to have died in this incident. There have been reports of controversy regarding the disclosure of information in the tragic submarine accident. Coming to you live from Taylor Square, we have the wives of one of the victims of the tragic accident, Mrs. Christina Romani. <laughs> I want to know the truth. Disclose the document. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I'm with the, a representative of the Ministry of Defence here to ask her about what is exactly the view of the Ministry of Defence with regards to the public disclosure of information in the tragic accident of the submarine. The Minister of Defence decided to exercise the public interest immunity to recall the document in relation to the constructions of the submarine. No! Disclose the documents! The people deserve to know the truth! I deserve to know the truth! Public interest immunity, previously known as Crown Privilege, is an exclusionary rule of evidence. It is a principle of English common law that aims to ensure that the documents are not disclosed in the courts during the process of litigation, where the disclosure will be damaging to the public interest. When public interest immunity is applied, it excludes relevant evidence from production in courts. It certainly affects the process of litigation and makes the court be in the dilemma of public interest and the right to fair trial in court of the party in dispute. Lord Bingham and Makazwana and Commissioner of Metropolitan Police has made an interesting comment on public interest immunity. He mentioned that public interest immunity is not a right but a duty. Where a litigant or party to a case holds a document that is prima facie immune, this does not mean that he is bound to exercise the public interest immunity without weighing the public interest and administration of justice. He should have the duty to consider the balance of public interest is in favour of disclosure or not. Although, the ultimate judge of where the public interest lies is not the parties in dispute but the courts. In Duncan and Camel Lab, the House of Laws ruled that any claim made by the Crown was final and not to be put under judicial oversight. But in Conway and Rimmer, it was held that the courts would now have to take responsibility to assess whether or not it would be in the public interest for the documents to be revealed. If a public body would like to seek a public interest immunity order, they are required to sign a public interest immunity certificate which then allows the court to make the final decision on whether the balance of public interest was in favour of disclosure or not. The court has to balance the public interest in the administration of justice and the public interest in maintaining the confidentiality of certain documents that would be undesirable if disclosed. However, it is still a powerful privilege afforded to the public bodies in today's time. The fundamental immunity allows them to conceal certain documents like documents that are concerned with the national security, as shown in Balfour and Foreign and Commonwealth Office, documents related to police investigation, as shown in Evans and Chief Hospital of Surrey, documents related to a human source or police informer, as shown in Cardiff and Rock. Public interest immunity was originally something in which the executive enjoyed the greatest prerogative power over, but recent years has seen a diminish in its power. The public interest is pursued in order for there to be a proper administration of justice. So this means that uh, domestic peace is ensured. Um, it is said that the parameters of public interest is set by the courts and not as much by the other hands of the government such as the executive and the judiciary. Um, court judgments define the usage of this largely evidential doctrine. One of the earliest cases on this issue is the case of Camelot where it was held that the courts will have 
no hand in validating a claim of PII by the executive. A claim of PII by the executive, whether it be on class or content claims, uh, will be allowed independent of court oversight. This is done to ensure that the civil service will, can function with efficiency and properly, and also to re reduce it being impeded. Um, in the case of Duncan and Kamenai, Lord Simon emphasized the need for integrity on, on the part of the executive. The executive cannot make claims solely based on whether documents are labeled confidential or if official. There has to be an actual harm created, such as in the case where uh, documents will affect national security or there are sensitive information within it of cabinet meetings, cabinet minutes. It is clear, however, that there has been a lack of integrity in these executive uh, within the chambers of the government. This is seen in how a minister is labelled a rebel if they choose not to make a claim in a case where they feel there is no actual need for the information to be withheld. The use of public interest immunity was put on a statutory basis, which allowed for courts to take a more interventionist role in the validation of public interest immunities by the executive. The Crown Proceedings Act 1947 uh, allows for the courts to disclose documents in the interest of justice. That being said, however, the executive still retains power under Section 28 as the power of the court in civil proceedings does not extend to a power to disclose information that uh, may not be in the public interest to make. The introduction of this statute illustrates the change in, in the attitudes and how PII should be claimed. The Parliament sought to, to curtail the liberal use of PII, uh, public issues immunity, by the executive uh, by putting PII on a statutory basis. The simplicity of the process of issuing PIIs led to an increase in number of, of claims for public interest immunity on class grounds. This caused a judicial backlash which resulted in stricter controls uh, for the usage of public interest immunity by the executive. This can be observed in the case of Conway and Nirma, where the court held that uh, the court will be the final arbiter on whether or not the information uh, within these documents uh, should be withheld from public consumption. That being said, however, in rejecting the minister's sole decision-making power, Lord Reed emphasized on the fact that certain documents should still be uh, withheld from public, uh, public consumption. Documents such as cabinet meetings, which uh, are protected under the cabinet ministerial responsibility um, should be withheld from public consumption under class names. Um, the disclosure of information such as uh, cabinet meetings might fan ill informed or captious public or political uh, criticism as to the inner workings of the government. This was the reasoning uh, behind Lord Reed's decision making. Premature disclosure of these documents could also cause plans by the government to fail to come to fruition due to premature criticism of the government's decision making. The decision in Conway and Nirma, however, left the government unhappy. There were reports of a coordinate, coordinated civil resistance against this unwelcome interference into the affairs of the professional civil service, thereby, so to say, undermining the, the civil service in its functions. This resistance took shape in the confusion and deceit that was spearheaded by the executive in later years, such as in the cases of um, in the Matrix Churchill case that was that collapsed later on, and uh, even the case of Air Canada. In the case of Burma Oil, the oil company looked for disclosure of information relating to the rescue of the company by the bank. Lord Wilberforce held when, that when a claim for PII is made on manifestly solid grounds, the court should assume the responsibility of inspection only where a strong positive case has been made to demonstrate that the documents were needed for a fair hearing. This shows how the criteria to which the court is deemed PII valid has increased, making it harder for the executive to issue a PII and be successful. Now looking at the case of Air Canada, the House of Lords ruled that a party seeking the disclosure of documents must show that the documents were likely to contain material which would give support to its contention in an issue which arises in the case. Lord Fraser and Burma all used another test put forward by Lord Keith, where there must be a reasonable probability of documents in which question being of substantial support for bargain for it to be unconscionable. 
from both of these cases, we can infer that there has to be good grounds in order for the courts to allow the non-disclosure of documents when public interest immunity certificate is issued. During the trial in Matrix Churchill, the government said that in the name of public interest, it had the absolute right to restrain information even if it was important in the defendant's case. In this case, ministers abused their powers when signing public interest immunity certificates and hid compelling evidence during the trial. Later, former minister Alan Clark confessed that the government wanted to hide information pertaining to the fact that the UK government was secretly selling arms to Iraq. Furthermore, in the case of Al Sweedy, the judges relied on the words of officials in their submissions. This case illustrates that the court do not have much say when it comes to the disclosure of documents and the executive has most of the say on matters relating to public interest immunity. It has been suggested that claims made by the government are based on mere knee-jerk arguments for secrecy based on habit or figments of government imagination. This conveys the fact that government, the courts are obliged to the executive, especially on matters pertaining to high policy and materials which causes political embarrassment to the government of the day. But it has argued that class claims are unnecessary and that all materials concerned can be under content claims. However, the government views class claims as vital in maintaining candor between civil servants and ministers in the formation of policy. That is, they would be wrong and inimical to the proper functioning of public service if the public were able to hear the high level of communications. However, as shown in the trial of Matrix Churchill, the government relied on class claims even though the information was not detrimental to public interest. From the case discussed, it has been clearly shown that there are many conflicts within judgments made in the House of Lords on matters pertaining to public interest immunity. Lord Wilberforce argued to assume the role of advocates for open government, which is in direct contradiction to Lord Dennings and Lord Keith view, who believe in the open government methods instead. It can be seen that judges are trying to uphold the notion of separation of powers, as the courts are not meant to interfere with the business of the executive. If courts interfere too much, there could be statutory retaliation. Former solicitors, solicitor General said one cannot delegate to a judge the decision whether or not Crown privilege should be given without involving him in matters of public policy, which are also his ambit and in which it is most undesirable to involve him. This shows the conflict between the judiciary and the executive when it comes to matters of public interest immunity. PII has seen much development in recent years a lot of which was kick-started by the Matrix Churchill Affair. So this was when public interest immunity certificates were signed in order to deny the court evidence which might have led to the acquittal of the defendants in the trial. This incident highlighted how public interest immunity claims could be abused by the government in litigation. These events led to the release of the Scott Report which, where several reforms aimed at tackling this issue were suggested. One of the reforms carried out was the abolishment of several classes where a PII certificate could be granted, such as internal Whitehall policy advice and national security documents. The reasoning behind this was that genuinely sensitive material was adequately protected by contents claims. So while this development did narrow the possibility of PII claims being made in cases without genuine necessity, the abolishment of these classes could reduce the effectiveness on police informants. So this issue is one of growing importance given the changing nature of police work, where there is an increased focus on a more proactive strategy centred on targeting the activities of known offenders. In this category of operations, information gathering at the hands of informants are vital. Assuring the anonymity of such informants could very well be a matter of life and death. The police have argued that now anonymity is no longer guaranteed through a class claim. Not only will informants be less protected, potential informants could be discouraged from coming forward with information in the future for, be, for fear of being ousted. Besides that, there have been criticisms aimed at the scope of the Scott Report, particularly its failure to adequately address the conflict of interest presented by the Attorney General's uh, position as a law officer. Although Convention has already mapped out uh, the separate roles of the Attorney General in criminal and civil cases, the extension of PII into criminal, criminal cases bridges this divide. While the Scott Report included that in the future, departments should be represented separately in criminal cases, no guidance was given towards the Attorney General advising ministers on future PII claims, as was the case in the Matrix Churchill Affair. 
This lack of clarity on the role of the Attorney General in such situations not only threatens uh, separation of powers uh, due to the overlap between the judiciary and the executive, it could also manifest into another instance of political abuse of PII unless more clear guidelines on the implications are set. Finally, in criminal trials, it has been argued that PII cannot be claimed without threatening the fairness of the prosecution. This concern is elevated by Article uh, 6 of the EC, uh, the European Convention of Human Rights, uh, which protects the right to a fair trial. As a result, the rights of the accused uh, and how much to disclose must be balanced against other interests such as the need for secrecy in relation to police investigations and national security. Given the potential impacts of PII on Article 6, a rigorous scrutiny of the domestic procedures by the courts is necessary. The courts uh, seem to acknowledge this concern in the case R and War, War, where a more balanced approach to the disclosure of uh, sensitive material was laid out, whereby uh, the Crown should inform the defence of potential sensitive material, and the court would be the one to rule on the claim of whether this material should or not or should not be disclosed. However, in the European Court of Human Rights case of Rao and Davis uh, versus, uh, and UK, uh, where it was unanimously held that the two individuals concerned had not received a fair trial in the UK justice system after relevant evidence was withheld from the defence on the ground of public interest immunity, uh, this case shows that uh, PII claims are still able to be misused and even abused in the system and further development on this issue is still necessary in order to establish uh, a fair justice system. Originally, PII was known as the crown privilege where the government, acting in a place of crowd, would have the right to immunities. Prior to the CPA 1947, two basic principles governed the legal li liability of the crowds whereby the king could not do wrong and cannot be sued in a court of law. This rule was, however, abolished soon after the enactment of CPA 1947 under Section 28, where the, where the courts would held that the crown to be more accountable, such as produce documents and attend to certain interrogations. This rule was subject to two exceptions, namely the armed force on the duty or on the premises and, tor and torturous actions committed by the home. The government continued to rely on these exceptions in order to withhold the document in respect of the public interest. This posed a question on whether PRI has involved in this aspect. In responding in this question, it is important to look into the case law governing this aspect of law. First of all, the paramount case of Duncan and Cameron Ray, whereby the Winscount Simon held that the court would not allow to dispute a crowd privilege, claimed as this remained to be one of the other prerogatives. It was until the comment everywhere that the Lord Pierce knew that the Duncan's war had caused an undesirable effects toward the legal spectrums where there would be no checks and balance on the government actions, interrupting the rule of law where the diocese state that no one was above the law. And it was caused ultimately over Duncan's and denotes that the court should have discretions upon whether a PI claim is to be successful. Lord Ray's judgment seems to be suggest that there were two public interests at stake here. One whereby there may be a harm done to the society if the document were to be disclosed, and the other where there may be a frustration on the administration of justice. Hence, the Sir William Waite in administration law labored the cons they were the consway as the case whereby radical reforms and finally took place in relation to PII. However, Conway does not resolve the PII complexity. Several court scenarios have portrayed the claims whereby the document should be withheld to prevent the camera of communications would unlikely succeed. Lord River Force in Burma Oil and Bank of England held that the higher sensitive of the document, the greater the degree of the respect which it would likely to be shown when it concerned claims to be held. However, this should not deter a court discretion to inspect the documents privately as per Lord King's judgment in Burma. Air Canada and Secretary of State for Trade is also significant. Lord will force state that the court's first priority should always be to find a just and fair result for the litigants while administrating justice. Concrete evidence is 
incorrect while concerning the clip of PII. This case seems to be agreeing that the principle set in Conway. Lord Stanman went on to state that the court is appropriate in examining the documents and deem whether it is necessary for the PII claims and that the public interest would not be prejudiced by disclosure. Lord Wolf and Jeffrey Joey note in the Judicial Review of Administration's action that the document consisting of the confidential information would generally be refused if it's concerned the enforcement of law or the national security. The Court of Appeal were of the opinion that the document made during the course of police complaint investigations shouldn't be disclosed on ground of public interest. But how of law in ex parte really? Overall, this as law proof state that the recognition of the new case based PII required a clear evidence is necessary. This question of whether the PII claim was a variable, a variable was due with details and CC of Greater Manchester, where the Court of Appeal held that the reports which formed a class was prima facie entitled to PII, otherwise, there may be a window of communications. Thomas B. Hope stated that the prospect disclosure shouldn't be accepted unless it would generate an undesirable and an inhibiting effects on the investigating officer. In this instance, the court are willing to accept the classes of document which would attract PII if it's such creation of the class is necessary. In conclusion, perhaps the main contemporary and continuing concern in relation to public interest in Rindy is it is in contrary to the right to fair trial in courts. Article 6 of the Human Rights Act 1998 has safeguarded the right to fair trial in courts. Those who oppose the use of public interest immunity argue that by denying the parties access to relevant documents in a trial process, it deprives the party of a fair trial. However, the exercise of public interest immunity allows documents that are detrimental to the public interest to be withheld. It is important that the legal system allows for the prevalence of the public interest over the individual's right so as to ensure the greatest societal benefits. In Law and Davis and the United Kingdom, the European Court of Human Rights has also held that Article 6, the right to fair trial, is not an absolute right and there could be measures restricting the rights so as to safeguard the public interest. Furthermore, the concept of checks and balances has allowed the courts to examine the public body's decision of exercising public interest immunity so that justice is served by taking into consideration of all the facts of the case in trials and public interest of the country. The Crown Proceedings Act 1947 allows the court to disclose documents in the interest of justice. Although the public body still retain power under Section 28 since the power of court in civil proceedings does not extend to disclosure, which would not be in the public interest to make. While for criminal cases, the score reports has recommended some reforms and have been accepted by the public bodies. Thus, class claim for public interest immunity would no longer be made in criminal trials. It is undeniable that the public interest immunity has evolved over the years. From the case of Duncan and Cameron Land, where the court were not allowed to question the Crown privilege claims, to the case of Conway and Grimmel, where the court was able to assess the application of public interest immunity. A case which most exemplifies the arbitrary use of public interest immunity by the executive is the case of Burma Oil and its subsequent collapse. The misuse of public interest immunity resulting from a lack of regulatory apparatus has caused the other arm of the government, the judiciary, to restrict or limit its usage. The Scott Report elucidated the problems with the system of public interest immunity at the time, making it easier for the government to modify the circumstances in which it can be claimed. This allows for a more regulated and the purposeful of public interest immunity in the modern day. Where public interest immunity can be reasonably applied to only certain issues like national securities and documents relating to police investigation.